Martin Tomczak is currently at Loyola University ISET doctoral program, uh, he's a doctoral student in our university here. Uh, his focus is on theology. His primary research interest is exploring the systematic roots of the Catholic worker movement and its lived theology, especially the early church's influence on the work of Peter Morin and Dorothy Day. Marty holds a BA in history and theology from Benedictine University and an MA in the history of Christianity from Wheaton College. Prior to beginning doctoral work here, he spent two years teaching seminars on Dorothy Day and Peter Morin at Benedictine while partnering with the Nativity House Catholic Worker in Lockport to provide an experiential learning component to his learning communities. When he's not engaged in academic endeavors, Marty enjoys volunteering at the Lincoln Square Friendship Center or spending time with his wife, dogs, and cats. Marty, welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, I'm a little bit under the weather, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but again, uh, as with the Catholic worker movement, many different approaches uh, to how to get things done. So I do not have a PowerPoint, I apologize. Um, I, have, I will be sharing a paper uh, on the topic of Dorothy Day's prophetic witness. If you have it in your brochures, the title is Decriminalizing the Marginalized. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Murphy and my fellow panelists for helping to put together um, this insurmountable task of trying to discuss Dorothy Day's prophetic witness in this short panel. Okay, so as with any theological exploration, it is important first to define terms and contextualize our subject matter. It's quite common to throw around words like prophetic and witness without knowing exactly what they mean. So before we begin, it's necessary to dissect this central term of my title. When I teach a course on the theology of justice, we spend a section of the semester discussing the prophets. And one of my favorite portions of the class is asking my students to tell me what a prophet is. Now, I receive answers ranging from a fortune teller and someone who can see the future to some more nuanced approaches, like those old guys in the Bible that no one listened to. And my favorite answer, Kanye is a prophet. <laughs> so while some students are on the right track, I provide them with the following definition. A prophet is someone who has been called upon to speak for God. The Hebrew word nabi reflects this definition, but we get our English word from the Greek prophetes. It is a combination of the prefix pro, meaning to stand before or in front of, and the suffix femi, which means uh, to declare. The verb femi is also closely related uh, to the verb uh, uh, phino, which means to shine. So if I can apply a little bit of poetic language to our rather dry definition, a prophet is someone who brings things to light for the community. They literally illuminate others and they provide us with moments of epiphany. Although there are many strains of prophecy present in the Old Testament, an overarching commonality present as we examine those figures and moments of illumination is that they often played a destabilizing and critical role for their contexts. Time and time again, the prophets were sent by the Lord when justice and righteousness had been abandoned, when the poor, suffering, and vulnerable, the, mar the marginalized had absolutely no hope remaining, when covenants with the Creator had been abandoned, and when the systems and institutions meant to protect and preserve the rights of the most vulnerable had failed. We turn to the New Testament for further clarification of this word. Aside from the use of prophet in reference to John the Baptist and Jesus himself, we also see uh, many other expressions of this word in the beginnings of the post-resurrection ecclesia. The most notable example in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul talks about uh, the office of the prophet and prophecy as a gift of the spirit. So history tells us that uh, while the various heretical cults uh, that arose meant that the function of the official prophetic office ceased to exist, the question remains for us. Can it be again outlined as a function of the church and as individuals within the church? Uh, well, we need not look further than Pope, Franc than Pope Francis's uh, <clears throat> exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, and his specific mention of Dorothy Day in his address to Congress to find that prophetic witness is indeed actually a continuing element of both the church uh, and of faithful individuals going into the 21st century. 
So we finally turn to a woman who embodied the spirit of prophetic witness to the fullest. Dorothy Day served as a prophet, not in an abstract way, uh, nor did she do so through grandiose acts or unapproachable feats. She did so through everyday acts of kindness and through the adoption of the gospel message as a tangible concept rather than a lofty goal perched in the clouds. Uh, a blended model of questioning the complacency of the masses and creating direct plans of action uh, can be an apt descriptor as we attempt to define how Dorothy exhibited this prophetic witness. In her autobiography, Miss Day spoke about, quote, using such weapons as works of mercy as an immediate means of showing love and alleviating suffering, end quote. She also highlighted the weapons of journalism as being in her arsenal to fight injustice. While we could spend the entire day, and in fact we will, discussing how the various facets of the Catholic worker movement can embody instances of prophetic witness, I'm gonna focus my talk on the journalistic aspect of Dorothy's prophecies. After explaining the function of a newspaper, I'll specifically highlight two instances appearing in Dorothy's column of the Catholic Worker that have direct relevance, or I think, have direct relevance to our own social political climate before concluding with an analysis, uh, an overall analysis of a prophetic witness. The start of the Catholic Worker newspaper came about in May of 1933, and although it has been utilized as a marker for the start of the movement, it, uh, its conception in the mind of Peter Marin predates that first publication. The paper was created with several distinct goals in mind. At first, it was meant to connect the average person to the social teachings of the Catholic Church. Second, the paper was to serve as a critical voice in the lives of wealthy Catholics that had become complacent <laughs> in systems of injustice. Okay? Although the paper reached a circulation of 200,000 copies within the first five years of publication, uh, you, we did see a number of uh, problems created by Dorothy's column, okay? Uh, people did not like to be reminded of the responsibilities that go along with the privileges that they have. Uh, the hate mail that Dorothy received is a testament to this, right? Very much like the Old Testament prophetic witness not wanting to be listened to. Lastly, the paper was meant to catalog works of mercy and provide information for future action. And so now we turn to these specific instances of social critique uh, that I find apt. In July of 1937, Dorothy wrote a column entitled, Who is Guilty of the Murders in Chicago? This is 1937, not now, by the way. The article aimed to explore police violence against laborers in the wake of the Memorial Day Massacre of 37. And Dorothy specifically wrestled with the theme of sharing the burden of guilt. Steelworkers employed by the Republic Steel Company were aiming to secure a new contract that in included wage increases, better working conditions, and the right to unionize. What ensued was one of the most bloody and catastrophic labor strikes of the 1930s era. The police opened fire on the strikers, leaving 10 workers dead and 60 wounded. Now, as we saw earlier today, Miss Day was no stranger to Chicago, having moved to 37th and Cottage Grove as a child. Later, she moved uh, closer to the north side at Fullerton and Clark. Dorothy also recounted that she took many long walks with her brother, and these walks uh, would have her face injustice and poverty for the first time in her life. Chicago played such a crucial role in her life that it's no surprise the emotion jumps out of the page in her column when talking about the riots of Memorial Day. She recreates the scene as follows. Have you ever heard a man scream as he was beaten over the head by two or four policemen with clubs? Have you ever heard the sickening sound of blows and seen people with their arms upraised trying to protect their faces, stumbling blindly to get away, falling and rising again to be beaten down? Now having awoken her audience, she continues the column uh, and takes it beyond the carnage to try and explain the source of violence. She says, on whom shall we lay the blame for such a horrible spectacle of violence? Of course, the police and the reporters, in many cases, lay the blame on the strikers. But I have lived with these people. I have eaten with them. I have prayed with them. And they are ordinary people, just like you and I. They are men and women, many of whom have never been on a strike before. Shall we blame the police? Or shall we blame Tom Girdler of the Republic Steel Company? The Lord knows how he can sleep comfortably in his bed at night with the cries of those strikers, of their wives and children, in his ears. So, 
after a discussion about the necessity for objective reporting in the face of hysteria, Dorothy provided her prophetic assessment of the situation as follows. In that case, we are all guilty in as much as we have not gone to the working man as the Holy Father pleads and repeats. In as much as we have not inclined our hearts to him and sought to incline his to ours so that we could work together for peace instead of war. And as much as we have not protested such murder as committed in the streets of Chicago, then we are guilty. She concludes the column. Have pity on us all, our Lord, on Tom Girdler, on the police, the souls of the strikers, as well as on all of us who have not worked enough for a new heaven and a new earth in which justice dwells. Now, while it might be slightly anachronistic to link this episode to contemporary movements uh, for labor rights and calls for solutions to the plague of systemic violence in Chicago, this panel was indeed asked to discuss Dorothy's influence on the 21st century. I'll not dwell on it uh, very long because today is about celebrating the life of prophetic witness, but it bears mentioning. When we look around and we see movements such as the Fight for 15, the non-unionized worker strikes at O'Hare, the CTU labor disputes, demands for humane conditions amongst undocumented workers, and calls for police reform, it is perhaps necessary to revisit Dorothy's conclusion of social sin and sharing the burden of guilt. Have we worked hard enough for a new heaven and a new earth where justice dwells? My second example revolves around the Catholic workers' campaigns against racism and segregation throughout its existence. In the February 1971 issue of her column, Dorothy focused her pilgrimage section on the plight of UCLA professor Angela Davis as she was relegated to solitary confinement at the Marin County Jail while she awaited trial. In response to the situation, Dorothy pleaded with readers not to prejudge Davis as media reports of her guilt spilled out of California. She used this singular instance as an example of a larger problem, the systemic racism saturating American society. Dorothy wrote, quote, Angela Davis is a beautiful young woman, a graduate of Brandeis University, and at a time when jobs, even in the academic field, were scarce, risked her livelihood by openly stating her faith in the kind of social order which she thought would bring about justice and a better life for her black brothers and sisters. We all know the flagrant discrimination which keeps black people in the slums, the first to be fired, the last to be hired, unable to achieve the status of college students, and so the first to be drafted for the ever-extending war in Southeast Asia, where our mad violence has laid waste to the land and slaughtered people." End quote. And she concludes that column. In terms of denying God, how often do we deny Christ in our destitute brothers or in those of a different color? race, or creed. Dorothy followed this column up with a catalog of the Catholic workers' long commitment to, commitment to racial justice and a juxtaposition to America's system of white supremacy. She reminded readers that from the very beginning, from that first issue in 1933, that they had covered the story of job discrimination. She also offered new insight on the closing of the Baltimore House, often associated with its decrepancy. But Dorothy argues that racial integration may have had something to do with the frequent visits from the police. Three decades before the historic challenges to segregation in the American South, Miss Day writes, quote, whites and blacks together under one roof was not acceptable to others at that time in Baltimore, end quote. The Huma House was listed as another example of, the Catholic, of a Catholic worker home that was closed in the 30s specifically because of its concept of interracial community. The Memphis House is fondly recollected as having been run by a black nurse to alleviate child care for agricultural workers. She thanked and uplifted the black members of Houses of Hospitality in New York. And then she included a succinct analysis about the tumultuous relationship between justice and destitution. As follows, quote, it is hard to be complacent about gains made. Such gains, for instance, on my last visit to Natchez two summers ago, when we could drive around in a car together, black and white, eat together at restaurants, visit the tutoring projects where black and white work together, but destitution continues. Critiques of this destitution included the questioning of a foreign policy, which sent black and brown bodies to Vietnam while at the same time offering them nothing here in the United States. Dorothy also attempted to connect the dots of criminalization of black and brown bodies uh, for her readers. 
The beatings and torture of present in prisons, the lack of support structures for ex-convicts when they were released, the refusal of whites to acknowledge guilt or exhibit solidarity, the heavy bail bonds placed upon the poor, okay? and an overall apathy towards the foundational concept of innocent until proven guilty. However, let us remember that our model here today for Dorothy's prophetic witness was not simply one of critique. It was also one of programmatic response. In her column, Dorothy lifted up the actions of people like the Berrigan brothers, whose ministry included getting arrested and going to jail to live in solidarity with those there. She highlighted the necessity to start and support schools for ex-convicts, like one of the Houses of Hospitality had done in Milwaukee. She applauded the actions of those that visited prisoners and put out a call on the Catholic worker for book donations to prisons. She ended that column on systemic racism by highlighting that, quote, we in America are being afflicted for our own sins and for the sins of our country, end quote. So, as we look around us and see the revelations, or rather confirmations, of the Department of Justice report on the CPD, as we wrestle with the implications of Michelle Alexander's monograph, The New Jim Crow, as we sit in a cultural space right now that sees hate crimes reminiscent of the 1960s being perpetuated across our country, as we hear Reverend Massingale call for the Catholic Church to wrestle with its history of complacency and racism, and as we await reprints and extended editions of James Cone's books because he doesn't think his work has been done, and as we look to Dorothy Day's question, have we worked hard enough for a new heaven and a new earth? where justice dwells. So as we're left with these two specific examples of prophetic witness present in Dorothy's writing, it is perhaps best to zoom out and collect our thoughts. The examples were chosen by me for specific reasons. Uh, the first, the Memorial Day riots, association with our geographic context, firmly places Dorothy Day's uh, understanding and witness in a place that we know and love, the city of Chicago. And the second example is a particular research interest of mine. This does not mean that we relegate Dorothy's witness to these two examples. We have already discussed the futility of trying to encompass everything that she's done in our discussions here today. Instead, we're forced to consider the connection between all of Dorothy's acts of prophetic witness. What connects the prophetic witness exemplified here? The answer is simple. Unequivocally, Dorothy Day argues that the way to speak prophetically to society and to combat and is to combat and deconstruct notions of otherness. Whether it is through a critique of criminalizing laborers, criminalizing black and brown bodies, or criminalizing any other group that we haven't gotten to yet today, the ability to criminalize starts with the categorization of the person as the other. The divisions that Dorothy sought to overcome through community, through table fellowship, through acts of kindness, and through her weapons of journalism were all reflective of breaking down these boundaries of otherness. The examples of her epiphany are many, but they all fall under this umbrella of combating otherness. When she ends her autobiographical work by telling the reader that, quote, we cannot love God unless we love each other, and to love one another, we must know each other, end quote. She provides us with a programmatic outline for how we are to conquer the divisions that plague our society. So as we sit here today and we absorb Dorothy's words, as we are reminded of her prophetic witness, we ponder our own potential responses to otherness as students, as teachers, as activists, as members of society entering the 21st century. We have to ask ourselves Dorothy's question once again. Have we worked hard enough for a new heaven and a new earth where justice dwells? As we sit with this question, as we examine our own context for instances of othering, as we attempt to wrestle with the potential of a dark future, I hope and I pray that Dorothy Day's prophetic witness shines light upon us. Thank you.